The world is in chaos and sits on the edge of a precipice. There's never been a more important time to get into prepping and preparedness. And yet, so many people find it so difficult to start. Why is that? Why is it so difficult to begin to become a prepper? To become a prepper means to take personal responsibility for a lot of the types of things that are normally managed by society at large. And while our society can oftentimes appropriately be accused of being a little bit good for nothing in a lot of areas, there are a lot of things that it legitimately takes care of for a lot of people, and to have to start taking all of those burdens onto your own back can be a little bit daunting. So in this video, we're going to break it down for you. We're going to take the top five things that you really ought to do if you're just starting off into prepping. And I got to warn you, number five, you're not going to like it. I love the chase and the hunt and I set the pace when I'm running. I always take what I want and I always give it 100. Don't need a bank, no, I'm funded. Play the game like it's nothing. I'm always thankful for something. Don't take for granted, stay humble. Not waiting, better believe in your mind because it's everything. You can mold, shape, find almost anything. Hey everybody, this is Praxis, and in this video we are getting you ready to go. If you are new to prepping, these are the top five things you need to do right now to get going on it. And remember, number five, you're not going to like it. But we're not talking about number five right now, we're talking about number one. Number one is food. Now, I know this is a big issue with a lot of people, because I know there's these jerks like me, and we're essentially living in a grocery store in our houses, the pantry in my basement, and uh, it can be kind of daunting. If the idea of going from zero to this is what's holding you back, that instinct, it's not serving you very well, so just abandon it. What you need to do is just start very small, and it starts with going to the grocery store and finding something that you like that's on sale. And if it's something that's shelf stable, buy a little extra of it. That's the way most of the stuff here in this pantry was bought. It was stuff that was bought when it was on sale. And that's one of the great things about prepping with a pantry is most of what I eat is stuff that I bought on sale. So I'm saving a lot of money while I'm doing this as well because I'm getting that 10, 20, 30, whatever percent discount off on everything I eat because I'm taking advantage of the sales when they're happening. And because of that, I'm able to fill up my pantry. Here's an example of this exact idea. Bunch of pumpkins here in the back of my car. I bought these recently after Halloween because you can save an awful lot of money on pumpkins if you buy them after Halloween. I paid $1 for this pumpkin, $1 for this pumpkin, and $1 for one other pumpkin, very similar to these, which I'm pressure canning right now. All the rest of these pumpkins were free because birds had nibbled at them, which makes them completely unappealing to most people. But the pumpkin flesh on the inside of this pumpkin is totally fine. The seeds on the inside of this pumpkin are totally fine. And anything that's not totally fine in this pumpkin is going to be totally fine for my chickens. The idea of setting back food in your pantry, even a lot of food back in your pantry, isn't a situation where you have to be spending an awful lot of money, if you know how to do it. But again, you don't have to worry about filling up an entire huge pantry like this. Start with one shelf. Do you think you could fill up one shelf within, I don't know, maybe a month or something like that? You get a little bit on week one, a little bit extra on week two, a little bit extra on week three, you know, four weeks in the month. Maybe you can fill up just one shelf. Now, I know a lot of people will say, okay, well, what's that shelf really going to do me? If we experience some kind of a major cataclysm in the next month or so, you know, I'm, so I'm going to have a shelf of food. Who cares? Well, you probably will. If you were facing some kind of emergency situation and you had the choice between having at least something and nothing, which would you choose? Probably the something. And the idea is you repeat this process. You fill one shelf, then you fill a second and a third one, and eventually you're going to fill up a space like this. Now, if you want to have some tips on specifically what to buy, aside from make sure you buy things that you like. Don't buy things just because they're on sale. Don't buy things just because they're in some totes and there's emergency food and some totes. What if I told you that these two heavy duty totes contain the chopped up dead body in my former tax accountant? who stabbed me in the back. Buy stuff that you like and cycle through it, but you wanna buy stuff that's gonna be shelf stable. So if you want some tips on things that you can get that are shelf stable, click on this video link up here. But before you do that, we're gonna talk about number two on our list, not the number two that you were thinking. The second thing that's critically important that you nail down that you absolutely need to have is some sort of a heat source. Unless you live in a place that's warm all the time, and I know a guy in Puerto Rico, and he's going to comment down in the comments below, well, if you lived in a warm place, you wouldn't have to worry about this. A lot of us don't. A lot of us choose to live in a place that's cooler. There are a lot of benefits to that, as well as downsides. One downside is you do need to stay warm, and given that, you need to find a way of doing that. Now, I use a wood stove here at our house. You don't have to use a wood stove, but you need to find a way of keeping yourself warm. One great thing about wood stoves, you can do a lot of different things with them. One, you can keep your body warm. Two, you can cook on it. You can bake on it. There's an oven over this one. You can boil water on this. You can sanitize over this. You can dry your clothes around this. There are a lot of different functions that you can 
build into a wood stove. Not only is it heating your house, but it is also preparing your food, sanitizing your water, warming your water, and doing all these other different sorts of things. In terms of hygiene, if you need to warm up water to wash with, warm water can clean you a lot better than cool water can. You can warm water up over the stove to do that. There are so many different benefits. But even if you don't want to have a wood stove, you need to find some way of keeping yourself warm when the temperatures outside are cold enough to kill you and they don't have to be that cold. Many people that die of hypothermia are dying in temperatures that are, you know, in the mid 50s degree Fahrenheit. It doesn't have to be below freezing to kill people. It just has to be cold enough to get your core temperature down. And that's why some sort of heating source, some sort of way of warming your body, warming your house, and doing all these other sorts of cook functions that is off-grid is critically important. If you don't have a way of doing that now, absolutely get that done. The third step in our journey here is water. Now, many people will say, well, that should be your first step because water is critically important, and it is. But one of the advantages of water is that we happen to live on a planet that has an awful lot of it. Now, not all the water on our planet is clean and ready to drink, but your focus doesn't necessarily have to be like it is with food, with stockpiling a lot of it. Your focus can be on the idea of being able to purify for your use the water that is available around you. And that's a much easier proposition, especially considering how much water we need every day. Of course, for short-term emergency situations, it makes sense to have some potable water set back and ready to go, but for anything of a longer duration, you really have to be able to get it from your landscape. What I do here at our house is that we have access to a well, and we pump water out of the well using solar power from our roof. Now, that is a setup which could withstand lots of different emergency situations, but there are all sorts of things that could go wrong with that setup. For example, the well pump could break, or any one of the components in the rest of the system could break, or even the solar power system which runs it could have an issue. So it's always important important to have secondary backups, again, on something so critical as water. Right next to me is our backup, which is that there are many streams here on our property. And it's important for you to identify things in your landscape where you could get water if you needed to. Now, those water sources don't have to be potable in and of themselves, but as long as you can get the water, you can get water filtration and you can filter the water for your use. Another thing that's critical to think about when you are using your water is to think about using and reusing it as many times as possible. Here at our house, we have a gray water setup, so any water that we use for bathing or washing our laundry automatically gets fed into a greenhouse garden and waters the plants in there. And by doing something like that, you can multiply the hydrating power of any water that you do secure. In terms of water filtration, there are many approaches that you can use. They can be as simple as one of those life straws that you just stick right into a water source, such as a stream, and you can drink right out of it, or you could use a larger filtration system like a Berkey. Here at our house, we do have a Berkey filter system, and we can use that very simple type of gravity drip system for treating water from a stream to satisfy all the water needs that we have. But whatever system you use, Make sure that you have backups, make sure you have redundancy, and make sure above all else that you do identify some water sources in your local vicinity, whether it is rainwater collection or streams or whatever, because no matter how much potable water you set back, water is such a critical asset in your life, it's important that you have an endless supply. The last topic that I wanna to discuss before we get to the dreaded number five is your ability to protect yourself. There are many different ways of approaching this topic. Some are active and some are passive. Here in North America, the active approach oftentimes involves something like a firearm, but the passive approach is the one that I want to discuss first because I think it's oftentimes overlooked and it can yield much better end results than the active approach if done properly. What I mean by a passive approach is the idea of trying to avoid conflict situations, to avoid dangerous situations in the first place. Any kid that's ever been involved in a fight at a schoolyard knows that even the winner of that fight usually comes away with some souvenirs that they'd probably rather not have. And the same is oftentimes true when it comes to violent interactions between adults. If it's possible to avoid a fight, it's usually beneficial to do so. But what does that mean in real life? Does that mean if somebody wants to steal your car, you should just give it to them? No, what we're talking about is avoiding situations in the first place, avoiding a situation where somebody is even in the position to want to steal your car from you. What I'm talking about here is keeping yourself and your family out of dangerous situations, not going to places that have a reputation for violent interactions between people, not living in an area that has a history of burglaries and violent crime. One huge benefit to living out in the country like my family does is that crime tends to be very low. While we do lock our house up at night, probably on necessarily so, we never lock our cars, which would be an insane policy if we lived in an urban area. When different parts of the world and country are going mad with violence, out here in the country you'd never even know it. So that's the primary action that I think most people should take for their own self-protection, is to put themselves in a situation where they don't have to worry about a lot of these issues in the first place. 
But what happens if a passive approach in itself isn't enough? It's certainly possible for trouble to find you wherever you might be. So for that situation, it's important to be able to have an active response. Here in North America, an active response oftentimes involves the possession of firearms. Now, if you're new to prepping and preparedness and you're not necessarily comfortable with the idea of firearms, I want to let you know that you're not alone. While I own a number of firearms, they're not something I'm particularly excited about. They're loud, they're expensive, they require maintenance, they make a lot of noise when you use them, they're dangerous, when you touch the ammunition it can leave lead powder on your fingers afterwards, they take up extra space for storage, and did I mention that they're obnoxiously loud when you're using them? They're not something that I get really enthusiastic about. But I understand and I accept the reality that sometimes it's necessary for people to be able to defend themselves when there's no one else to do it for them. You might not be happy that that's the way reality is, and that's okay not to like it, but it is important to accept it, because even a casual viewing of crime statistics forces us to recognize the fact that while police officers are charged with and endeavor to try to keep society safe, they can't be everywhere at once, and sometimes it has to be up to you. We finally reached the dreaded topic number five. Now, what is it about number five that I've promised is gonna be disliked by so many people? Well, there's a big difference between what we're about to talk about now and everything that has preceded. We began by talking about stocking up your pantry with food, shopping the sales, buying as much food as you can, even if you're on a budget. From there, we moved into making sure that you could keep your house warm. I would suggested that we'd purchased a wood stove to make that happen, but there are all sorts of other different devices and different approaches that you could have to that. We moved on from there to purifying water and the uh, idea that you can use different sorts of devices for that, whether they're very small filters or larger filters. From there, we moved on to personal protection. We talked about securing a home in certain areas that are going to be safer. And we also referenced there are certain tools that one can purchase towards the ends of protecting oneself. Everything prior to this point has talked about the idea of procuring things, usually purchasing things. But item number five has nothing to do with purchasing anything. It's all about the way that you think about things, the way that you problem solve, and the way that you view the world. The world is full of problems, but it's also full of solutions. And far too often people are blinded to a lot of the solutions that abound all around us. And it's very easy in our consumerist society for that to be the case because most of us have been trained from a very early age to think about problems as being something that requires some intervention from outside. If you get a cut, you use a bandage. If you get some kind of a rash, you buy some sort of a cream. If you need to get somewhere, you gotta get yourself a car or at least a bicycle because ain't nobody gonna walk nowhere. The idea of solving things completely on your own is something that's really been bred out of us for reasons that are kind of obvious. There's a lot of money to be made if people can sell us things, but it's rewired a lot of people's brains to not have the capacity to think outside of that kind of a box, that consumerist sort of a box, where if you need to solve a certain type of problem, this is the specific solution that you need to use and anything else isn't gonna fly. I see this all the time here on YouTube where I'll make a video about some kind of DIY approach to solving a problem and invariably there'll be somebody or usually multiple people who will swoop in and say that this totally wouldn't work because you need this product in order to solve that problem or you need to do it in this particular way. These are the only ways that this problem can be addressed. Uh, notwithstanding the fact that in the video I demonstrate that what I'm doing functions and actually works. Even seeing an alternate approach work isn't enough to convince most people that there is more than one way of addressing things. And the fact that so many people get mentally stuck in just one lane and they can't conceive of the idea that there are multiple ways of getting to a similar goal is not only a problem for our society at large because you have people at odds with each other, uh, you know, bickering with each other, you know, you know, my way's better, no, my way's better. But on an individual level, it can be really handicapping. Again, getting back to that idea that people just get stuck in their lane. If you have some kind of obstruction in front of you in your lane, oftentimes people will just stop stop right there in their tracks and not realize that there's alternate routes, there's alternate lanes that you can use to get around this sort of impediment. And in an emergency situation, this can be especially problematic. And I try to advocate for this on my channel all the time, that it's important to open your mind to multiple ways of addressing problems. Where I'm recording this video right now is in my greenhouse where I mentioned that I use gray water for watering the plants in here. I've been told multiple times here on this platform in videos about my gray water system that if I do what I'm doing, all these plants here will be dead. 
Clearly that's not the case. It's very important, especially in emergency situations, to open your mind to different ways of approaching problems because when it's a life or death situation, you can't afford to just get stuck in your lane and stop. It's critical in emergency situations to really be able to bend with whatever the pressures are at the moment and not get stuck on the idea that there's only one way to address problems because if there's only one way to address whatever problem you're dealing with and that method, that way, that route of addressing that problem requires materials that you just don't have, if you can't get outside of that type of thinking, you're just gonna stop in your lane and not proceed and fail to rise to the challenges in front of you. It's okay to address things in ways that maybe aren't the best. It's okay to address things in ways that are different. And it's okay to try new things and sometimes have those experiments succeed or fail. And that's why it's important to do these kind of experiments and practice these things ahead of time when your life is not on the line. And that's what I'm advocating here for in point number five, is to be flexible, to not get stuck with one way of doing things, to not start with the conclusion and trying to work your way backwards, to try to force reality to be the way that you want. The past several years going through the COVID pandemic was an excellent example of people being very piss poor at thinking in this way. And I mean that both from the official level where the government came up with a plan, they started with their conclusions, and then they tried to make the facts fit the reality that they wished things were, even though it became more and more obvious that that was not the case. And I also mean that for a lot of the fringe people who came up with theories and hypotheses that they convinced themselves were true. And despite more and more evidence coming out that their initial ideas were untrue, they just kept sticking to that. The idea of starting with a conclusion and working backwards from there always sets you up for living in a fantasy world. And the last thing that you wanna be doing in an emergency situation is being detached from reality because it's gonna close your eyes to certain things that don't fit that reality. And when you close your eyes to aspects of reality, you're missing all the opportunities that are in those areas that you're blinding yourself to. This is a difficult skill to master, of course, but it's very critical that people practice this in order to try to become more flexible in their, their life and their way of thinking about things and their way of problem solving. So while this point number five is difficult, you can't just buy your way into it, it's really critical. I hope you found this video helpful. And remember, take small steps, inch by inch, wherever you're starting from, you'll eventually get there. Hey YouTube preppers, here's another video that you might enjoy. But before you click on it, I wanted to take a moment to thank all the people you see listed on the screen. They help to support the work that I do here over at patreon.com. If you'd like to join them and have your name added to that list, the link's below.